We knew coming into this spring campaign that our goals were ambitious. Raising $75,000 is not easy. But this increased amount will help us cover increased costs as we close out our fiscal year on June 30th. We've made great progress, but it's time to roll up our sleeves. As soon as we hit the 75 k mark, we'll end this campaign. If you have given recently, we thank you. If you've ever considered supporting Working Preacher but haven't, now is your time to step up. Take a moment, think about all of the ways that Working Preacher has accompanied you in your ministry and know that your gift of any size makes an enormous difference. In the last 12 months, we've surpassed the 5 million user mark for the first time. Amazing. This is all made possible by your generosity. Go to workingpreacher.org slash donate to make your gift today and thank you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, uh, which falls on June 16th, 2024, um, are Ezekiel 17, 22 through 24. Our alternative uh, reading is 1 Samuel 15, verses 34 through chapter 16, verses 13. The psalm is number 92, verses 1 through 4 and then 12 through 15. The epistle is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10, and then 14 through 17, or actually you can just read all the way through verses 6 through 17. And our gospel is Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 34. And I should say, Happy Father's Day. Thank you. <laughs> You're uh, so, yes, we've got these uh, two little parables in Mark uh, little, coming right. off. Okay. The, um, coming off of uh, the parable of the sower. I loved Clifton Black's, Cliff yes. Black's commentary. <laughs> yes. It was a hoot, especially uh, the God's kingdom is like the smallest seed that grows up to become the greatest. <laughs> oh, zucchini. <laughs> Yes. I've heard that about zucchini, that they just grow like crazy and then people are trying to give them away. But I didn't know that why I didn't put that together in terms of why everybody wanted to give me a zucchini. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But this uh, this first parable is, uh, as the commentary points out, is unique to uh, Mark and uh, has some interesting titles, right? The the parable of the growing seed or the parable of the seed that grows secretly. And I appreciated the particularly uh, Cliff Black's connection to that that secret seed, you know, really connecting to the the mysteries of the kingdom and mm-hmm. uh, and how it's a it's a reminder that as much as we might want to predict or or control in some kind of way uh, the the kingdom of God and its and its spread, <laughs> uh, and at the end of the day, that is that's God's authority and God's uh, that's God's reign and uh, and so that's one you know that's one really I think helpful reminder, but also promise right of this seed that you don't really do anything. And it just, there it is. I love the line he includes uh, that I I also would add uh, to your introduction is where he says, um, um, for all their obscurity, one thing is clear from the parables in Mark 4. Jesus claimed that God's sovereignty undermines all human notions in the most preposterous manner. I like that perspective of it uh, in terms of being preposterous. Like the, well, the the first of these two parables is really one of my favorites, mm-hmm. even though it's so simple. Um, like, like we've said only in Mark and it, it belongs in Mark. Like it, it wouldn't make, it wouldn't fit Matthew or Luke. 
And it's just so marking with this idea of a seed that does its thing and the sower uh, does not know how is the best line, right? None of this depends upon any knowledge of gardening, <laughs> no science around botany, anything like that. And it just grows. And it's so important in a gospel where people don't understand and where Jesus is rather mysterious. And none of that is really a problem. Like it's a problem to us. We're like, what happened to the ending of Mark? What's going on? How come the disciples are such idiots? And in Mark's world, in Mark's theological landscape, this is how God works. God works in these mysterious, unseen ways. And it does not depend on your faithfulness or your insight. It depends on God's own doing. So, you know, it's so it's the worst story ever, right? Somebody planted a seed and it grew is essentially the story. And then eventually there was a harvest. Uh, so there's no plot and there's no characterization, but it's just this lovely theological gem, especially when we consider what it comes after, with which is the parable of the sower, the parable of the four soils, yeah, which is such a disturbing parable in so many ways, especially the interpretation Jesus gives in verses 10 through 12. Right. So there's something about this and the parable of the mustard seed that's kind of a life raft to help you get through the rest of Mark's gospel. Well, I'm just going to tag on to the life raft uh, idea um, because I like to also remind us that uh, uh, Jesus is talking about farming to fishermen. And so this is... Um, for, for me, I've said this before, being from the city, I don't get farming. I don't get planting, uh, planting seeds. And so I have to lean in a little closer to listen to this text. I have to stop, slow down, pay attention. And then it's okay for me to keep scratching my head because like you said, it's so simple and yet it doesn't require our understanding of it which to use Black's word is preposterous. Um, but I also think that it's important for us to remind uh, our listeners that um, Jesus is talking a different language, a different metaphor uh, for a different audience in some ways. And uh, um, we might not want to take this as if we understand this so clearly. I think one thing, too, that I I find really uh intriguing about this story because as you said matt it's like the seed is planted and it grows that's it end of story uh but but look at look at mark's narration of it i mean you actually he draws it out which is so unusual for mark that you know that the that the person who scatters the seed would sleep and rise night and day and then the seed would sprout and grow uh, and does not know how. And then the earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. And so I think that narration in and of itself is a place for us to pause as well and to say that this mark is really, uh, it, it's a very simple thing but it's uh and and a very simple truth but it is the way in which he draws it out so i think emphasizes the really the lack of control on the part of the sower and uh and because all of the emphasis is on the seed sprouting and the earth producing of itself without without the sower doing anything and so i think that's another uh, it's it's a small detail, but it really is important, particularly for uh, Mark's narration, usual narration. Yeah, yeah, and and in the context that these fishermen who've learned that you know they know how to fish and don't know how to fish um, are being introduced to a different way of sustaining one's community. Um, there's fish, and then there's vegetables, and. <laughs> Um, there's no more control over how the farmer farms than there is how the fisherman fishes, or at least that's what they found out. And I think the, the other thing, though, is that then you get the sort of urgency, if you will, with regard to when the grain is ripe, but once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. Yeah. So that there's that also that recognition. It, it's also a call to... Uh, recognition of 
of the blooming of the kingdom. Um, and and what 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 will we do with that? What will be the response to uh, to that growth that we see and um, and and that recognition because. Because Jesus isn't here, you know, as it, Jesus isn't here very long. And so how will we recognize the way in which uh, Jesus is bringing about the kingdom? Uh, and as I said, what will be our response to that? Yeah, which is why I think it's nice that they're paired together in our lectionary reading with because the, um, the mustard seed, it's important to help people get a sense for that line, the greatest of all shrubs is, is hilarious. <laughs> and setting this next to Ezekiel 17 will help with that, that Jesus appears to be drawing on an old image, but now he's making it mustard, which is not difficult to grow, which, uh, you know, is thick and dense, but by no means the greatest of all anything, you know, and so it, except perhaps something that reproduces easily. And so, but then it's, you know, the success here isn't so much a harvest, it's the safe environment for birds to nest and to reproduce. And that's, I think, really significant as well, right? That that the the fullness of the kingdom isn't so much something beautiful to look at, but it's a place that supports thriving and flourishing. And with the mustard seed as well, you have, uh, yeah, the the absurdity of greatest of all shrubs, right? But the emphasis is also on the sown part, right? Mm -hmm. Again. It is like a mustard seed when sown upon the ground, and yet when it is sown, it grows up. And so that does take you back to the previous parable of the of uh, really an emphasis on the ground and the earth and mm -hmm. what it's going to provide without without really us doing anything. Yeah, and to give people a sense that it's not like people are growing mustard on farms in like large quantities, right? Yeah, you right. don't need. <laughs> You don't need acres and acres of this, um, so it's a it's a different kind of cultivating as well, which is significant. Which gets us to the point which Cliff Black says um, that one of the greatest hazards to try to explain this too much, yeah, right, <laughs> and, and to, to just let it out there um, and and let it do its thing. Which which parallels also the um, the ending of the reading, at least for this Sunday, where it, we're reminded that this is how Jesus is teaching uh, repeatedly with all of these little stories, uh, with all of these little parables, and they will um, the explanation is going to come in private to the disciples, um, but maybe that's what we need to do every once in a while too is to know that we're using a good metaphor and then to step back and let the spirit do what the spirit does with it. Matt, you mentioned Ezekiel. Should we go to Ezekiel? Yeah, I don't know what you're going to do with it, except to say this is where, you know, Jesus gets all of his best stuff from the Old Testament. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. That he does this frequently or he's taking familiar images and giving them a new shape. The link for me with... Uh, what we've been talking about uh, uh, from uh, Mark is uh, who's doing the accomplishing, um, who's going to do it, and that this this is uh, this is the work of God. This is what God is doing. And the context too. I mean, important to note this is this is a, a prophet writing in exile, having visions in exile about uh, severe hardship, and so here's an image of being back home of a tree that's. Not necessarily native, but you know, you can get them in Lebanon, and you know, and and the idea of a tree that provides all that shade is is one of rest and comfort, and to help get a sense for how certain images nourish at certain times in life, and what might work for somebody else might not work for you at a given time and place. But I think to to make that connection, I mean, it's it, you know, it's um, it's obvious, but it's always helpful, right, for uh, if you're going in the Mark direction, uh, I would definitely bring in the Ezekiel text and show mm -hmm. how how Jesus is relying on on this imagery, and particularly, uh, and as you said, imagery in the context of um, of a people of of a people at a loss for um, for the promises of God. Where are the promises of God? And so, uh, and and to, just to show how 
this language that you get in Ezekiel is really expanding the promises that Jesus is also making in Mark. And so I think that's, it's always when I, when I, when I teach the preaching the Old Testament in our beginning preaching class, I always talk about this as one way that you can preach the Old Testament, right? Not necessarily preach on a text, but you're showing that, uh, that the New Testament doesn't make sense without it. And I think that's always a, a, a helpful homiletical move, if, especially if it's as obvious as this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. For Samuel? We'll go to the alternative reading. Money. Yeah. yeah, we've skipped a lot. <laughs> oh my, yeah. We've skipped a whole lot since uh, Saul was anointed king by Samuel. So just to note that, that you know, in, in six days of, of not being at church, uh, a whole lot of uh, history has passed by <laughs> under, the, under the bridge. And yeah. Saul has not done so well in terms of God's estimation. Samuel seems to have an obedience problem. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And since part of that has to do with Samuel, it's not, right? It's not just it's not just God and Saul. It's Samuel's kind of peeved in this whole process as well. Now, how how long do uh, d- does one hold to uh, those who have been lifted up, even though they display that they are not um, worthy of the honor that they once. Um, they once deserved and once um, were afforded. Um, you know, this is a calling out on God. You know, Samuel, move on. I've moved on. So I, what I love about this passage is the danger that's in this as well, where Saul's like, you know, I'm sorry, Samuel is saying, look, this is, if I go do this, Saul's going to kill me because I'm essentially... <laughs> you know, guilty of subverting his rule. And God's even like, yeah, just make up a lie about sacrificing to me. Like, it's kind of, yeah. Don't worry, just hide into the cloak of religion. You'll be fine. Politicians do this all the time. Uh, and then, you know, when Saul gets to Bethlehem, you know, the elders are like, you were the last guy we want to see here because you're a king-making person. Yeah, we just do not want to get pulled into this, this intrigue as well. So just to, you know, the story itself is, Playful and kind of, you know, David's origin story, but it's also the the politics of the day are also part of this text. And so just to help people see that, that, you know, and, and not just, you know, if Saul's life is, sorry, if Samuel's life is at stake and if Jesse's family is implicated in this, that means plenty of other innocent people are as well, right? If this is going to break out into civil war, this yeah. is... Very risky. And the power of this is lingering, staying close to the context, the full narrative, and um, staying in the text. Um, This passage, this scene, this episode really speaks to our current reality. And, um, you know, this is one of those places where the closer we are to just speaking to the text, um, the more folks are going to, uh, that are open to the Spirit, are going to realize that it is calling something from them. This isn't just a, a story to be entertained by. This is not just a scene that moves along in uh, ancient Israel story. This is a very pointed Biting story of what happens when, um, what are the consequences of unfaithfulness to God? And I think if you're doing the David cycle, it, you know, it, it, the whole narration of, of how David gets anointed um, and the, uh, just making that connection again for people uh, with regard to where does David you know, where does David come from? Mm -hmm. Uh, And maybe even, um, you know, maybe even doing some fast forwarding to how that plays out for um, how, how, you know, continuing the thread for people with regard to why are these stories important? Um, Not, not only for the sake of, of knowing uh, the, the challenges and the experiences of God's people prior to Jesus, but again, also the ways in which uh, these there's this 
thread, right, that connects to uh, that this is this is where Jesus' origins are going to come from. And so mm-hmm. this is one of the reasons why we think about this and we and we and and going through the um, the story of of David and the story of the kings and is um, is a way to um, complicate that history yeah, uh, that I, like I think that. sometimes we you know sometimes we we forget and I uh, and that God enters into those those complexities and um, for the sake of relationship with God's people and that doesn't change once once uh, Jesus comes along. So it's an, it's an, again, it's another kind of way to, uh, to remind people of the importance of, of these stories, not, not only for the sake of what they're telling, but the way in which they get reinterpreted um, in our own, in our own, you know, uh, Christian interpretation, right. Of, of, of the Bible. For everything that this tells us about God, there's a great deal that it tells us about Uh, ourselves, about humanity and how human societies are shaped and what becomes central. And even in terms of how we read this text, what becomes central and then how we live that out in our lives, whether we um, attempt to separate, um, you know, what happens on Sunday from what we do Monday through Saturday. Um, If we're reading this as if a focus on God would not uh, allow us to have a focus on the king, um, the prophet, um, the people. Uh, I didn't even anticipate that alliteration, but um, but you know we can't read this story without seeing um, the fullness of life of humanity in relationship to God and what it means to be uh, God's people. All right, the psalm. We probably should have gone to the psalm before we went to. Uh. <laughs> The psalm is definitely right. The connection to the cedar and the seeds, the seeds and all of planting. That. Mm-hmm. That's definitely where, where I would use the psalm. That uh, the way in which uh, we have again more language to put to that promise of growth and um, and what God does and uh, and those expectations. And so it's just, again, it's a way to, it's a, it's a way to create a vocabulary in the sermon Mm -hmm. uh, that you're borrowing (laughs) or you're using the language of the psalmist who recognizes also that truth about God Mm -hmm. uh, and Ezekiel and then Mark. And so it can become a really, I think could be a really powerful sermon to recognize the way in which um, illusion and not not a lesson on illusion and imagery, but a lesson on a lesson a on the, the, the kinds of imagery. Yeah, but the kinds of imagery and illust and and uh, illusions that speak to a truth about God uh, that that is communicated in Mark, but then of course also known by um, known by the writers of the Old Testament. That's what I would do. <laughs> I would, uh, I, I like that. I would take my my theological cue from the way the lection is designed. You know, we often wonder why there's cuts and things like that. But the very first sentence of the psalm, I think, is really helpful. Mm-hmm. And to carry that forward. So those first three verses have the first sentence, and they're all about giving thanks. Mm-hmm. And so that's, the, that's our response. If what it says in verses 12 through 15 are true, our response is to give thanks. If the parable of Jesus, the two parables of Jesus are true, our response is not to, you know, plant more mustard or do better at learning botany, right? Our response is to give thanks. And so this idea of control being kind of distanced from you and given to God or ascribed to God isn't um, isn't an excuse. It's not a, a judgment on the, on human capacity, right? It's finally about God's willingness to uh, to bless and so the human response is maybe not a hundred percent to give thanks but certainly that's where we begin anyway that's what i would do yeah good mm-hmm. all right second corinthians, second corinthians this is our third third reading in our walk through the book of second corinthians and uh we have some familiar Pauline themes here, but uh, in particular, I wanted to point out 
uh, the, the, the last verse of the lection. So if anyone is in Christ, uh, there is new creation. And, and this is also true for Galatians 6.15, where you have that, uh, the, the um, grammatical construction is that there is no a new creation, right? It's just new creation and which which Paul says in in 15 for neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything uh the translation is but a new creation but it's not it's just but new creation <laughs> and so which is because of uh verse 14 for the love of Christ and that is the love I I think that's a subjective genitive that the, the love that that Christ has demonstrated, the love that Christ has embodied and given, uh, to which Paul is pointing that it's that it brings about uh, it brings about new creation that is uh, not just a new creation but new creation everywhere. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new, and that's. Um, that's where I would go. I feel drawn to with this text uh, in particular. I, I think also in the season of Pentecost and uh, in June and in summer, I mean, there really, you could even do sort of a thematic uh, theological connection with the, the flourishing of the plants. And then, um, but this, but the way in which um, the way in which fundamentally the love of uh, the love of Christ or Christ's love, the way Christ's love loves, uh, it, it brings about, um, brings about newness and brings about, uh, uh, creation coming alive, if you will. So those are some, those are some connections I was making with the other passages, but just also how do you capture that grammatical construction in a way, um, that, that, shows this is not just not an example of a new creation, but it just is new creation, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes great sense. Those are my favorite Pauline paragraphs uh, mm. right here. And it's partly because of, for reasons you've just described, it's partly that line about not regarding anybody from a human point of view or mm. kind of according to human it's things. Flesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what would it really mean to look that, to act that way, to live that way? I would probably drive differently, probably the first thing that I do. <laughs> um, so to note that, I would say too, you might want to think about adding verses 18 through 20, mm. which conclude this paragraph in some real stirring ways, uh, talking about, about reconciliation, talking about our own calling to reconcile, to be agents of reconciliation between God and others. To become the righteousness of God, I mean, that's just soaring language there. And next week, you're going to get a text from 2 Corinthians where Paul is going to make an appeal to the Corinthians to be reconciled to them. Mm -hmm. Paul and Timothy on the one hand and, and the Corinthians on the other. And here he's setting that up as at the heart of the good news is a God who reaches out to us to reconcile us to God's own self. And that's the theological basis then for human reconciliation, not just the basis, but the model for it. And so you might, you could do two weeks where you talk about reconciliation, which is um, an important uh, thing to talk about. There's an e echo um, because we've threaded together the other text and there's an echo of this is actually what God has been doing as we read the other text as well. You know, um, humanity reject, uh, is ancient Israel rejects um, God as king, asks for a king. It doesn't work out. God doesn't give up on them. And we see that uh, in calling um um, in calling David, um, God doesn't see the way that we see. God looks at the heart. And then we um, recognize that this is the Lord's doing. And so then that picks up on, you know, the Ezekiel text and the, the Mark text of the, and the Psalm in terms of the flourishing of God. Um, and what all of this is, is that long arc of the story of a humanity being reconciled back with God and with one another. And so all of this in context is what the biblical narrative is offered for us. Yeah. And I think too, uh, the, the one thing that I, I, I meant to say when I was 
bringing up that verse 17 is that that love of Christ uh, demonstrated in his, in Christ's death and then and Christ and Christ's resurrection is that it becomes also another way to enter into the meaning of Christ's resurrection. Mm -hmm. Um, And what does it, and particularly that resurrection is connected to new creation. And I think then your, uh, your suggestion, Matt, of adding the verses is really important Mm -hmm. uh, to set up next week, because if there is then new creation, then how does new creation or, not regarding one from a human point of view, then lead to reconciliation. And so I think there's a way then that the preacher can make those make those connections um, that put the death and resurrection of Jesus, not just, and this is the this is kind of the brilliance of this part of the letter, right? It, de- Jesus' death and resurrection are not simply theological concepts, but make a difference then for how we live with one another. Uh, and be, and so then that, that new creation uh, is embodied in reconciliation.